as we cover many an insane movie and numerous cult TV phenomena. Are you ready to get jacked up? Are you with us? Then listen on. McKay, actress and singer. How are you today? I'm great. I've been oh, looking no, forward to doing all these inspiring interviews. And again, just another local, hardworking music talent. Oh, so, I appreciate that. Been at it a good few years now. So what made you go to, at this stage in your life and career, just decide I have, again, musical words to share with the world. And I know just the people to help me start this, make it professional and brought you to that to become an alternative pop artist? <laughs> well, I, I didn't always know it was going to be alternative pop that I wanted to do. I always knew, like, I mean, I have wanted to be a singer since I was a little girl and I saw Britney Spears performing on TV once. And I was like, oh my God, that is so cool. She is awesome. I want to do that. That looks super fun. And I was always singing and doing this. But um, as far as when I got into college is that's when I realized that I could actually 
write my own music because I was like, I, I was stuck in that old mindset of, oh, you know, you have to be discovered in order to, to live this dream or to be a singer, you know, you have to have some sort, sort of big record deal. And then I met this guy while I was in college and he played the, p or not the piano, he played the guitar and we just kind of started jamming out and I just kind of started singing and I was like, hey, wait a minute. So I went back to my room and I grabbed this folder of these lyrics that I had and I just picked one <laughs> and we wrote, that was the first time I ever put music or my lyrics to music and that's, it clicked in my head. I was like, oh my God, I can do this. So then I went to KD and I was like, you know what? I love doing musical theater. Any KD chance for those that, who don't know. <laughs> yes. Um, any chance that I can make a living doing any sort of entertainment, doing what I love to do, whether it's acting, whether it's on stage, whether it's my own music, whatever. I want to be able to do it. And I want to be the best at what I do. Very nice. So after... After several years after that, I had this huge breakdown and all of this stuff. And I realized, you know what? Mu music is what I want to do. Yes, I love to act. Yes, I love to do musicals, but I love to write my own music. I want to put my own music out again. And so I started and I, I put these really, really, really shitty demos on SoundCloud. And of course, they're off now because they were not at the quality or the standard that I wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. um, so fast forward a few years later, me and another guy, we started um, Current Waves. And that was the first time that I had put actual uh, an actual single out. It was called Trinkets. And then we did an EP together, um, the Letters mm. to You EP. And it was kind of a mix of pop and rock. Uh, because he had a very classical style or classical classical uh, piano type style mixed with heavy metal. So that was his style on top of my nice. <laughs> popish music or, or undertones. So I was happy to get that. But again, it wasn't at the standard that I wanted. So we broke up and I decided to because do my own music solo oh because i was because the things that i really wanted to do with my music he didn't want to do and i was like i feel like i need to do this and anyway there was a whole other reasons because he was actually my ex and so <laughs> there's <laughs> there's other reasons why it didn't work out but um that was when i discovered my sound engineer i Funny enough, so a friend from also Katie, uh, his name is Justin Labosco. He owns a recording studio uh, for Horseman Studios. And I reached out to him not knowing that it was only his studio. And I was like, hey, my name is Bree. Um, yeah, no, I just work here. <laughs> I knew Justin. I knew Justin um, when I was at Katie. I was wondering what your rates are and everything. And he was like, Bree. I know who you are. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I didn't know this was your studio. Anyway, so that's how I got started with that. And I've been recording there ever since. And it's at the quality that I want. So I had to find, I had to find a way. I know what my strengths are when it comes to performing in the music industry and it's the vocals and it's writing lyrics. So I've always I have written some of the compositions and a few of the songs and a few of the singles that I do have, but I know where my strengths lie and I would rather delegate that to somebody whose strength is the composition part. So that's when I found this guy who had this great deal on some beats that were right in my genre. They were in the alternative uh, electro pop type sounds. And so, I took them and I got the tracks and I got the stems and I make them to where I make them how I want them. Right. And then I go in and I record. And so that being said, I have an entire album that's going to be coming out this year. Sweet. Um, with that music. Were you always kind because, of 
first that way where you just you just had the ear for it or you're just like something's off or something needs a little more gain or a little less volume on this you know instrumental you know it's funny when i write the lyrics i in in my head i can hear the way i want the music to sound right what what i struggle with is making that come to life so that being said you know people there's this cliche where people say you know you can you can get far by yourself but if you want to go or you can move fast by yourself but if you want to go far you work with other people and so that's where i where i'm like you know what i want to go far i want to make the best product for my listeners i want the best quality so I hear the music and I'm like, oh, this makes me feel a certain way. The music makes me feel a certain way. And then I find if I don't have lyrics that I've already written, because I have a folder of over 200 songs that I have lyrically written that have not been recorded. And I probably oh, <laughs> won't. <laughs> yeah. And I probably won't record all of them, but they're there. And, um, I'll go in there and I'm like, do I already have something that I could, that I like already or that I can tweak around or should I write something new? And so I, I think about that when I listen to a new song. So that's kind of the process that I've been using for the, for the past singles and this upcoming album. So the, my past singles, I have five. And I'm actually putting them all together in a combined collection called, you know, it's so original, I know, but it's called The Singles. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm putting all five of the singles that I currently have on no there. No words, heard um, so good, cut the lights, casual, and unapologetically. And the latter of which you said was an award-winning music video, like you submitted it like to a festival. I'm so impressed that you know all of them. Wow. <laughs> you only have it in the descriptions, <laughs> but yeah, I mean... Yeah. I was on un unapologetically. I don't know. Now tell me if I'm dead wrong, but uh, I kind of almost got some subtle vibes of like Janet Jackson. You just you literally are putting on a dance show. A few Thank background you. Dancers. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I so that song that is one of the few songs that I actually wrote composition wise, and I'm very proud of that. Um, unapologetically in no words. Unapologetically I, proud of unapologetically. <laughs> I am so proud of that song. And I feel like that's my, my anthem because it, and it's funny. Um, yeah. And to go back to what you said, yes, it is an award-winning music video. Um, I submitted it to one earth awards. It got silver. Um, my song, no words. It got bronze for best pop song. So I'm very proud of that. Um, shooting for gold next year. But uh, unapologetically, I've gotten a lot of feedback from people who have listened to it and be like, I know what that song's about. And I'm like, oh, but you really don't. <laughs> right. um, a, lot of, a lot of people think that I wrote that about my ex. And I didn't. Oh, my God. Everyone I'm wants like, melodrama. No. They want Beyonce and Jay Z <laughs> type ways to sell a record, and it's like, no, let's no. <laughs> and the truth is, is I didn't write it about one specific person. I wrote it about a time period of events that really internally hurt me, and I didn't know how to process. And to the point where I was like, you know what? Why am I even stressing about that? Why do I even care what they think? Why the fuck am I listening to that? And so I wrote that. I was like, you know what? I don't care what you have to say. I don't care if you can't handle. Well, I mean, I, I say it in the song. I don't care if you can't handle me. So I feel like that's my anthem in being who I am. And um, I just, I love that song so much. <laughs> well, passion definitely showed and it was a fun tune. Uh, now, oh, great. And, thanks. And uh, you've done some musical live theater in the past before, right? If I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. And so do you think that just all kind of complemented it together and just halfway through, you're just like, yeah, I want to take that to the next level. I don't want to just do a show every you know, five days. <laughs> Absolutely. So 
when I did the music video, I approached a friend of mine who is a choreographer and I was like, look, I love the work that you do. Will you choreograph some dance to this? And so we had, I found um, two amazing artists, dancers, um, Lindsay Milam and, or Milam, I I really don't know how to say her last name. I feel really bad because she's a good friend. Oh, yeah, that person who's awesome. But <laughs> and, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> um, and Tanisha Jones. And they were so dedicated and so committed and they slayed. I mean, and I'm so appreciative to all the hard work and sweat that we put into that. And for the choreographer, Brian Peters, who um, yeah, created. Yeah. Yep. He created the the whole dance routine and I mean he made it fierce and it was so fun and um and then Kenny Wynn who is the videographer who shot it all of his equipment edited edited the music video and um I hope to work with him again soon on some some new some new music but oh, yeah nice. it was super fun so going back to the musical theater for sure knowing live theater always has a special place in my heart but being able to perform at that level on stage and having to have that muscle memory and everything I definitely think helps in the performance aspect of it totally because it was like the the only difference is that we didn't have an audience there was a camera as the audience instead um and I take that into I take that into the studio as well so learning from you know class at KD uh, the musical theater program, learning how to act the song, which was actually one of our classes, has definitely helped me when I go into the recording studio and bring in the emotion to tell a story. To, um, it's I'm a little totally bit. With you. Music, you can say so much, be more experimental. And I mean, I, I did a music video a few years back, and it was way more freeing than just being on a short film that no one saw or a movie, which, you know, takes way longer. You know, to make and just a music video, you know, you're, you, we came in at the perfect time, you know, like you said, SoundCloud mm -hmm. was a start, but now that Spotify is taking the world over, Bandcamp is a thing, it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, people are still going on to YouTube. There's people who even will still listen to whatever. If it's on YouTube, they just want to go there. Everyone's got a premium, oh, yeah. uh, you know, Wi Fi plan or whatever. And so they just cellular data and <laughs> they just, they just need something playing while they're at work, you know. You know, yeah on the computer I mean I'm the same way I I listen I listen to YouTube videos while I'm working more than I do regular music <laughs> it's just funny that way and like you say I just it doesn't take long to just market a certain way edit a certain way and just team effort a bunch of phone calls and emails later and you can get something done. yeah and it's but you know and you mentioned that music, doing a music video is so much more freeing. And I think that's something, that's a reason I have such a passionate desire and ambition towards my music is because you, music makes you feel things. You know, you can watch a movie and you can definitely feel the emotion. You can, you know, empathize with the actors, but you listen to the background music. The music is what like pulls at the heartstrings and tells you what the hell is going on, what you should be feeling. And, you know, so somebody told me. In the moment. <laughs> yeah, in the moment. And somebody told me the other day, I was mentioning my album and the, um, my album is, a collection of work around a time period um, and it was very healing for me to do I'm still working on it it's still very healing but writing it and coming up with it was very healing and in a very traumatic um, time period in my life and they mentioned you know I don't like that the entire album is going to be set to you know, this time period because it like memorializes what happened. Mm. And I Should sat and I thought about that. I sat and I thought about that. And on my way home from that visit, I was like, you know, 
so many huge artists have memorialized the roughest parts of their lives through albums. You take Rihanna and her rated R album. Yeah. About Chris Brown and his abuse. You take mm -hmm. Kelly Clarkson and her My December album. That is all about a very depressing era of her life. Um, Taylor Swift's Red is all about, mostly about Jake Gyllenhaal. Um, and then you take Selena Gomez and one of her albums is a lot about <laughs> Justin Bieber. So, and I'm thinking, yeah, you know, this album may memorialize a certain person and it's the part that they played in my life at that time. But I think all music and all artists at one point are memorializing some part of their life. Oh. And I think that's okay because if they didn't memorialize that part of their life, we wouldn't be able to connect with it and feel and understand what they were going through. And the whole reason that I'm still okay with doing that is because I'm not the only person who's going to go through what I went through. I'm not the only person who's going to resonate with what I wrote. Totally. And like and, you say, yeah. it, it is tough because like you say, you got to just clarify it a little more and then just like anything, if the I mean, person just feels they can't bring your vision to life, you find someone who isn't going to argue with you and is going to really just trust your motivation with it and really just pitch in on just little small things that make anything better. Like, hey, let's try a different take of this. Let's do this. And like you say, it, yeah, yeah, you do want right. to always, it, I mean, every time we started this podcast, I didn't realize we had to do so many different uh, just like trigger warning, but it's good to do because the last thing you need is people coming in in the middle of it and the classic case of, I don't really know what they're talking about, but I'm offended. And so like you say, right. you don't want to sound like you're promoting being a victim or anything. And at the same time, you do also want to uh, establish, Hey, here's how I got through uh, times in my life. I wish I didn't have to go through, you know, a hundred percent, a hundred percent, you know, and the, as an artist and as a writer, that's something that I, I, I tend to struggle with because there's a fine line between writing what actually happened and writing something that people are going to relate to. So you have to find a way to tell a story in a way that will not, because I look, as much as I take my personal life into consideration when I, like every, I, I write from experience and not, I, not every song that I have is about my life. But I do, I mean, most artists, as they do, they take from their own experience. But I try, I am very, I will never flat out say, oh my gosh, this song is about such and such, or put somebody on blast like that. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't believe in that because I would never want that to be done to me. Like, I mean, if it's a sweet song, be like, oh yes, I wrote this about somebody. But I mean, if it's a song where I'm like genuinely pissed off, and there's quite a few of them, there's quite a few of these songs that, you know, you know, if people know my personal life, they're going to know what it's about, but for the public, it's totally none of their business, what it's about. But what it is their bit, what is their business is how it makes them feel. But you bring a good point about, you know, finding somebody who can bring your vision to life and maybe add some tweaks to make it better. I went to a conference, uh, the Music Hustler Conference. Um, I did it virtually because I couldn't, I didn't know about it ahead of time to, to actually go um, in person, but I met a producer there. And so after this album that I'm doing, I am now working with this producer and we have already done one song together. And the way we co collaborated on this song, I had written, I had an idea it was flushed out and then he came back and he was like, hey, you know what, let's tweak this a little bit and bring the direction of the song in a different, he bring it in a different direction. And I'm telling you, I am so, like I'm keeping this one in my back pocket until after the, um, until after the album, but I'm very excited. And the best is saved for last, can you wait? The best out? is saved for last. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very excited about more collaborations with him because he's so very talented and he knows, he understands my vision. 
I can tell that he points. understands. My, <laughs> right. He knows what I'm trying to get across. He knows how to bring it in the music. I mean, the first time he, he sent me a draft for this song, I mean, I was like, oh my God, this is everything that I've ever wanted my music to sound like. And so, yeah, as, as a growing artist, there are a lot of people when there's a, there's a, a debate about whether you should buy beats and, you know, lay down tracks to the, those beats and everything or leasing them out. And for me, I don't mind that I have done that for this album because that's what I had to do in order to create music in the first place. That was how I could do it. And, you know, in this industry, especially independently, you just got to find a way to make it happen and have good quality music to make it happen. And so I did that. But now that I have found a producer that I can work with, I'm very much and very excited to, to pursue that after, after this. Very well said. Because uh, it does come down to people listening to each other. And it's kind of ironic if no one can pick a tone, especially if some of the themes in the songs are, please listen to me, you know, so it's a yeah. matter of just get on the same page and uh, just instead of just waiting for people to accept or reject to say, eh, I would want to listen to that. I would, to I don't think I would want to listen to that. Let's do a different version. Right. Of it, you know, and, and there are so many drafts, like you can listen to something and be like, and, and I, I have so many drafts that I go through as far as melodies go before I even hit the recording studio. Oh, yeah. And, and so I'm like, oh, I don't like the way that sounds. Or you know what? Maybe I can maybe I can make this sound a little different. And it's just, it's just a, it, you just play around with it. And, and one of the things that I've learned in this process, because I have released music and I've written music long enough to see what's right and wrong or what's, I mean, and it's not right and wrong, but it's bad saying what's, what works and what doesn't work and um, consistently finding better ways to do things. And I totally lost my train of thought where I was going with that. It's going to come back in a minute. Well, you're, you're so mainly what you're getting at is again, just staying focused and making sure that, you know, before you pull the trigger on this, that this is the vision and tone you want to go with. Oh yeah. And you, you rejogged my memory. So yeah, you just, you've got to continue to put things out and be consistent. Not, and you learn as you put it out that you learn the more that you do. And I have a mentor and he just says, you know, consistency, you know, put it out. Your music's not going to be for everybody. And that's totally okay. But if you can find the people who like your music, because at the end of the day, and something that I'm working on right now, and it seems to be good is that you know, people will listen to your music if they understand or they feel something, but most of your audience is going to come not because they like your music, but because they like you. So I have to build a product of myself, not just the music. The music is a byproduct of my brand. And so I've been working very hard on building my brand, what I stand for. And if people like that and they resonate that, that's how you find your true fans. And then they'll listen to something because they want to support you. And then they hear it and they're like, oh, I totally resonate with this. And then you've got like a super fan who listens to your song on repeat, you know? And gives so, it to his but friends. I have it's found, a, however it trickles down, yeah. Yeah, and I have found that, you know, so many people put emphasis on how many Spotify plays you get. When Spotify mm -hmm. is, <laughs> Spotify, <laughs> Excuse the French. Spotify can go fuck themselves. I mean, they are not the best platform. And they barely pay their artists. It's horrible. Um, it's not the platform that should be as big. But right now, it is. But that being said, I keep up with my Spotify artists, um, my, my app. And I can, I can check on my stats and everything. And what I have noticed and what I have learned to appreciate more is not just when I have like 3,000 monthly listeners, but when I have consistent plays, people who are consistently listening. So I'm okay if I have like 20 li monthly listeners because 
some of those are people that are consistently listening to the same songs, which means that they're resonating with something, which means I've done my job. Mm -hmm. And that means a lot to me because music is what got me through so much of my childhood, so much of actually almost every day of my life. And I just want to give back and give that the same experience to others. Totally. Very well said. Uh, and do you think we're just also at just a standstill or again, people are getting tired of what's, you know, mainstream music and you just got to find something just slightly different that really does stand out? Um, I think mainstream music is evolving a little bit, but it's still mainstream music is going to be mainstream music. And it's not based on what people mostly listen to. It's what the labels are pushing. It's what the academy is pushing. It's totally. Yeah, but independent artists are growing, and the industry, you find so many people or so many big name artists who were with big, um, the big wigs, you know, with like Atlantic Records or Sony and all of this stuff. And after they realize that their record deals are shit, they're becoming independent artists so they can have more ownership of their music and their rights. Like Taylor Swift is redoing all of her albums so that she can have all ownership. Seems um, like that is Dojo. the way to go now. Everyone reference their various, again, just music they did earlier. Don't get me wrong. If you want to, if you want to reach the masses, there's, de I mean, the big major labels, you know, they're going to give you that audience, but instead of being your angry. contract, <laughs> your contract may not be that great. You may not be getting, you may not be getting compensated like you would want to. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, uh, um, being, doing music independently, don't get me wrong. It's really hard because you're, you're doing everything. You, you've got to, you've got to build up a fan base and build up a following before you can even think about, or before managers are even going to look at you before agents are even going to look at you. They want to know that you're going to put into work. I mean, so you have to have a business mindset to it. Not only are you being creative, but you have to figure out marketing. You've got to figure out branding. You've got to figure out all of this stuff. Um, you got to think about analytics. How are you getting paid? Are you collecting all of your royalties? And there, so there's a lot that goes into it. And at times, I, I, and that's, I think, why the big labels are very much, or why the, the offers are attractive is because, you know, when people have those contracts, they can focus on the music. They don't have to worry about marketing. They don't have to worry about getting listeners. They don't have to think about that because they have an entire company to do it for them. But okay. they're paying for it because they get less royalties and less money off of their off of their music. Now, eventually, you know, when you when you build yourself up and you start making a living and you, you can afford to, you know, hire people out, like get somebody to do your marketing for you, by all means, if that's something you want to do and create a focus, you know, creatively on the music. I mean, that's where I would like to get at one point where, you know, I have a solid team of people who will work on an agent who will book the shows. We'll worry about that. Worry about the marketing. But until I meet somebody that I trust and would feel comfortable with giving them that part of my business to run, I'll do it myself. And right now, I mean, you know, it's, it's building up. And, and that's another reason I have a mentor is to, to help me to where I can get a, an ROI on all of the investment that I put into my music so that I can make this a full time and that I don't have to work. And on top of that, you know, I mean, we're talking strictly music, but I love to, you know, I've got other avenues, you know, I love, <laughs> with the acting, you know, I love to do that. So there's so many parts that play into it and it can get really complicated. I don't want to bog everybody down with that, but essentially 
you know, I think the, the term music hustler is an appropriate word because we're out here, you know, hustling to, to make our dreams come true and to, to share our passions. No, totally. And uh, you tried uh, submitting music to some other platforms. Oh, yeah. I have my plat. I, uh, my music is on all streaming platforms. So. Okay, nice. Uh, yeah, but, but, uh, on but, all I, streaming. but I mean, like local radio? I am looking into that. Because um, KXT, they're very friendly to that. <laughs> that's good to know. That's good to know. Um, you know, I think it's so difficult, especially starting out and as an independent artist, you get spammed with so many companies and so many, there's so many scam artists out there that you have to, I'm very, I'm very cautious about who I work with, or if I'm going to pay somebody for a promotion or marketing or something like that, I am very cautious about it because there's so many people who will take your money and do shit. Yep. So I'm very, I'm very particular but you know the grassroots way of reaching out is that has proven to be um very effective for me i've gotten on several playlists just because i've reached out and said hey you know what i like what you're doing or i like um i i like the different content that you're offering like obviously you know i go in and i do my research like there's a there's a girl um I think it's called Girls, and they send out a weekly newsletter of music, and I reached out. I was like, man, I love this. I don't see anybody else doing this, and they put me on one of their playlists, and it's it's just great, and so um, the grassroots way of organically reaching people is has worked really well for me in my, in my limited experience. Very cool. And then and I have really cool people like you who ask me to be kind. on this show. <laughs> <laughs> too kind. But yeah, no, I mean, because I'm seeing so many people acknowledge each other, but I mean, it kind of even goes back to just, uh, you see a lot of people, they make time for only themselves. And it's like, no, make time for everything. Don't, you know, support everybody. And don't just ask for, oh, I need a pat on the back. And yet you haven't been helping out other people. But at the same time, I mean, that hey, can you... You, you lose track of how many people will come home from work just annoyed about things. And you're like, wait, 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 wait. Don't take the negativity from work and bring it home. You know, just let's, mm -hmm. let's do something fun. Let's, and like you say, it, there are so many people, they say, I don't like today's music. I'm like, but they don't seek out other stuff. They just, it's easier to complain and bitch about it. And it's just like, no, let's yep. search it out. There's something good. Every era, it might take a yeah, little longer. Everybody and it's funny when you think about mainstream music you go overseas up into like uh the uk mm -hmm. pop music is the underground music oh, heavy yeah. metal is what's mainstream up there and i'm like that is so awesome and another thing that like totally grinds my gears is you know people who only listen to one genre they will bitch about any other genre like this is stupid or i can't believe we're listening to this i'm I like look if you are an artist and you only make one art don't go hating on other other genres because i mean we're all out here doing the same thing you're just expressing yourself in a different way to reach a different audience just because you don't resonate doesn't mean the music sucks yeah. So yeah, there can be bands, I mean, and don't get me wrong, I mean, there is music out there that people will put out that just genuinely sucks, but it's not a specific genre. It's just like, <sighs> but mainstream It's easy to call just, people sellouts or just making something too commercial, but like you say, people will use the words after a while to be like, do you even know what you're really saying or what that means? <laughs> well, and you know what? When people say it's a sellout, like so many people say that, People love Green Day, and then when they came out with American Idiot, they were like, oh, well, they just sold out, you know? And I mean, um, American Idiot is one of their top albums, but a lot of people say that they, they just sold out on that so that they could get mainstream. But when you think about it from a business mindset, they're still doing what they did. Oh, they're yeah. just making more money from it. And you mm -hmm. can't, I mean, they got to pay their bills and make a living too. And, and I won't lie. I fucking love that album. 
I know every word to every song on that album. Yes, when I was in junior high, I used to play that album on repeat with my best friend and we would sing the whole damn album. (laughs) And then we would go through it again in one night. I mean, that's how much we listened to that album. It's the same thing when they do the whole, uh, this person's only good up to this album or that album. It's like, that they can be apples and oranges, guys. I mean, there's such different tones. How do you even compare? Yeah, and I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's all personal and it's all subjective to the listener. So take, take um, my song Hurt So Good versus, say, Cut the Lights. They are so completely different. And I have a friend who reached out and I hadn't talked to him in quite a long time. And he was like, oh my gosh, you're putting music out? Yeah, let me listen to it. And so he did. And I was, he was like, man, you know what? I like Hurt So Good the best out of all the songs you've done because it was more mellow. And he was like, yeah, your songs are great and you're super talented and you're fantastic and I love it, but I wouldn't listen to it because that's not what I listen to. And I don't take that personally because it's just not what he's into. That's totally fine. <laughs> Seems like constructive uh, just feedback as pretty much I tailed it out of here. <laughs> it just seems like it's just so hard to just, you got either people just saying false things about each other or again, like you say, just too proud to just be able to say, yeah, you know, it's not like that. you know, it's just like, well, just say and, something. and like you said, everybody just, everybody has to have an opinion on it. Everybody has to have an opinion, even when they don't know what the heck they're talking about. There, there's somebody who doesn't know the first thing about the music industry or the music business, and they're going to sit there and tell you, oh, well, you should do this or do this or do that. Too much Be like, that. when did you become an expert? How long have you been doing this? Right. You know? <laughs> uh, you want, you care to cite that? <laughs> right. So, I mean, I'll listen to somebody who is farther and who's doing what I wanted. That's my mentor, for example. He is so knowledgeable in the industry and he has worked with so many great people and he's learned how to make those connections so I am sitting here and humbling myself to learn from him because he's making a living and doing what I want to do and he's got stories of working with people that I admire and I'm like okay (laughs) so every time I get on a call with him I am my ears blow up like a hundred percent so I can catch every little golden nugget he has to offer because I'm thinking if he can do it there is no reason why I can't there's no re if I am willing to put the blood sweat and tears into it there's no reason why I can not live out my dreams and I feel sorry for people who you know they get to a point where they stop following their dreams or they're like, oh, I, they have this excuse of I'm too old or I've got this responsibility and that. And they give up. And I'm like, like life's not for that. You're not supposed to grind away your entire life. Thousand percent. And so what, what gets you up in the morning when you just know you're going to do some studio time or, uh, music practice or even just writing songs out in your head or on paper? Well, I, I, what gets me up in the morning usually is work because, I mean, I do have another job. Um, Most but, people do, yeah. Yeah, but what gets me up in the morning is knowing that <sighs> you get like every day is every minute, every hour is something that I can create. It's some, I mean, I am building, right now I'm in building mode. I'm building a life that I want. I'm building a life that I dream. I'm very much a believer in the law of attraction. Um, And what gets me up in the morning is knowing, hey, you know what, every day is another chance for me to be where I wanna be. Maybe, and I, I have to find contentment in where I'm at already. Because I think about where I was last year, a Mm -hmm. year ago from now, and I'm like, I have grown so much mentally 
emotionally, you know, it, 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 that has nothing to do with, has nothing to do with my career. It just me as a person in general. My it was career definitely is not an what, endurance test and patience for everyone involved uh, all of last year. And so, like you say, it, uh, people are slowly realizing, you know, you grow a bit each year or you don't and you know, yeah. keep encountering the same obstacles that you want to avoid. So, yeah. You will, and so, I mean, that's hard. It's a hard question. Like what wakes you up in your morning? What is your why? My why has an absolutely nothing to do with my career. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, it, it's all like, I, like I said, I, I am, I'm very much about living the best life that I can live and be the best version of me that I can. And sometimes that's a slow process because sometimes I don't get out of my own way. And sometimes I do still come up with excuses and sometimes that I have to think, you know, this is, and it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And on days where I'm like, you know what, man, I wish, I wish I had a million followers on Spotify. I wish I had a million followers on Instagram and everything. I'm like, you know what? Hey, it's okay. Everything happens in its own time. So being it organically is hard for a while since they always give you the bots to start off with on any social media. Just I know. <laughs> so when anyone does the whole, oh, I got genuine followers, like there's going to be some fake followers in there somewhere. But yeah, it is interesting how uh, you have to do this market in addition to doing live performances and time in the editing studio. You just mm-hmm. pretty much got to set your priorities. And Well, and what I think about as far as, you know, the financial aspect of it, you know, I put a lot of, I, you know, I invest a lot of my money into my music and this and, and getting it out there, marketing, all of this. Um, mm-hmm. And my hope and what keeps me going and continuing to invest is that one day, it will pay off and I will get a return on my investment. <laughs> you know, um, it's not, I mean, and I, you got to think of it or I have to think of it as like, this is not a hobby for me. Maybe at one point, several years ago, I thought, Oh, you know what? Yeah. I really enjoy making music, but that's not, but it's not my job. Well, then there's a mindset switch switch mindset switch. <laughs> Say that five times fast. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, where, you know, you got to think, okay, if you really want to make a living and you really want to get to where you want to go and reach your goals with this, you can't think that this is just a hobby. You can't treat it like a hobby. You have to treat it like it is your job. So that yeah. means, so it took that mindset switch and you have to, so I guess anybody who is looking to you know, starter, you have just started off or you're looking to do that. You know, you got to make that mindset switch. This is not a hobby. If you want to make this a career, you have to do it and act like it is your job. You practice singing because if you don't use it, you do lose it. Yeah. You've got to write. The more you write, the better you get. You have to learn the business side of it. You have to. If you're going to be independent, you have to learn that until you are big enough and you find the connections for somebody to help you out in that arena. I mean, and I don't know everything. (laughs) I don't know everything. This is just what I have learned and what I have experienced. You know, when I made that mindset switch of, no, this is my job. I started telling myself, no, when people ask, what is my career? I tell them I'm a recording artist. I don't tell them what my act, my other job is. Because I don't view that as my career. My career, my legacy is my music. It's my entertainment. It's all of the above. So once I started, you know, saying, hey, you know, tell people, what do you do? Oh, yeah, I'm a recording artist. Then, you know, if you, if you think law of attraction, you're going to put that out into the universe. And <laughs> it's going to, you're going to attract the opportunities to make that your career if that makes sense I understand that might go over some people's heads no I well, exactly you are setting the tone no pun intended on literally uh where does this begin where does this end you know 
how does this become bigger than life? How do I organize this all? How do I keep it going? And yeah, more or less, you're also having to remind yourself of when, what, what you want to do next month to stay busy. Like you say, you've already found the in-between of making yourself happy. So now you got to find at this point, uh, just how do I get more people to listen to me and, you know, give me some feedback on right. my creativity. Yeah. And I mean, I, I know me and this, is, I am publicly, I am quite a humble person. But inside, I am very confident in my abilities and my skills. I don't always outwardly say it, but I know what I put out is quality music. What I put out, now it wasn't always that way. Like a reason that, like, there's a reason those demos on SoundCloud are not there anymore. <laughs> well, and we come but, a long way. I don't. Does anyone really use SoundCloud? True. 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 I, it seems like it's a startup point, but. Everyone's abandoning it for the other formats. Yeah, but I mean that I I I oh I always refer back to that because that is where I started, mm -hmm. and that's okay. I mean there are some people who put their first song out and it's freaking fantastic. And if they get to start, if that's their starting point, go then. It took me a little bit longer, and that's okay. Okay. Uh, well, uh, what do you have coming up? Any live tours or? Uh, you know what I other than your EP yeah so um coming in April I'm gonna have hard copy CDs of the singles so it's going to be the compilation of all of my current singles and then coming this year is going to be my full album and you can follow me on Instagram uh Brie McKay underscore official for all of that information. On top of that, I have a movie coming out in May. It's gonna be a live premiere in San Antonio, but there's gonna be a virtual premiere as well. Again, if you follow me on Instagram, you will have all of those dates and there's gonna be a Q&A with my co-star and me at the end. So the movie's Brie called McKay Top Five Music. Weekend. Top Five Weekend. Well, Brie McKay underscore official. That's the Instagram. Right, Brie yep, underscore and then McKay. Yeah, top five weekend. It's going to be a full length. Yeah, that's pretty much what I have going on right now. Um, Keep bringing out the best in yourself. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's, I love to see, I love to see when I first, like after graduating from Katie, all of the things that I have done and how the talents and the skill sets and everything have advanced and grown over the years to see like, performance wise where I was god oh my god that was seven years ago I can't believe I've it's been seven years since I graduated hey time flies anyway, <laughs> time does fly and then I mean the same learning. thing you know I, I I look back on you know where my vocals used to be and where they are now I mean I just look back even a year from where I was you know, because I wasn't putting out music or solos and until I remember my first one came out in 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic. And yeah. I look back and I'm like, it's like I, I, every single thing that I do and every single song or album or EP that I put out is a stepping stone, is a milestone for me to look back and be like, how have I improved? And it, that's exciting. On top of, you know, the whole, the whole process of creating a song and, and putting it together and watching an idea come to life and, and seeing the finished product. It's just, it's an amazing experience and I do it for that. Excellent. Hopefully this will inspire others to keep on their path instead of just giving up after a short amount of time. So. I hope so, Cam, you're so awesome. All right, not as cool as you. So, thank you for being on here. Stop it. <laughs> and uh, hopefully everyone else, you know, the uh, independent music scene continues. <laughs> so. I hope so. We'll return after these messages. Hey, feeling down? Feeling low? 
not enough podcasts about movies in your life, why not try... They must be destroyed on sight! The new Podcast Cure-All, sure to get you right with the world and on a path to better living. We have exploitation, we have Italian horror, we have zombies, we have slashers, we have crime films, we have spaghetti westerns, we even have sci-fi and sex comedies. So take a dose of... They must be destroyed on sight! As needed, and let the hosts, Lee Russell, Daniel Harper, Paul Romali, and the odd guest host, Cure What Ails Ya. Warning, may cause atrophy, African consumption, black fever, bone shave, chin puff, colic, cramp colic, dropsy of the brain, elephantitis, grocer's itch, jaundice, mania, miasma, fortification, palsy, pox disease, rheumatism, scurvy, St. Anthony's fire, summer complaint, and worm fit in some people. Consult a physician before listening. Did you ever see a film at such a young age it left you traumatized with cinematic wounds? Ah, uh, necrophilia. Uh, uh, uh. It's a dead issue, man. Don't don't push it. Cinema Psyops is a weekly podcast documenting an ongoing experiment on the mind of an unwilling test subject. No one should have to watch this movie. Oh, no one should have to watch this. No one should have to watch this movie. Surprisingly, it's not a topic that a lot of people really want to tackle. I'm shocked, prudes. I know, really. Right? It's the next sexual frontier that no one wants to explore. I am, in the most sincerest of senses, disappointed in you. It takes a powerful goddess like Connie, jam her arm down the monster's throat and kill it. Oh, I'm still tripping out over that. Even as a kid, I was like, I gotta find a girl like that. Every week, I, I get a new look of disappointment that I never thought I could get it's out of it. unimaginable. At 12 years old, you should not be watching this movie. Obviously. At 13, you should not be. 14, you shouldn't be. I'm not entirely sure even 17-year-olds should be watching this movie. Just because you're offended by something doesn't mean that you have the right to demand that it doesn't exist. Watching this film again, I had all of this like little nerd glee with everything Dude, that kept little history up. doll yeah, popping up absolutely. at you. So I totally loved this film. Hey, I know why you you know, couldn't see that. It's because your brain's warped from watching this shit at twelve years old. Yeah, this is this is a rough movie. I told you ahead of time when we were getting ready to do it that it was. How did be a rough you watch one. this shit at twelve? Because physical wounds heal, cinematic ones don't. Listen to Cinema Sion. Hey everybody, I'm Corey. And I'm Zach. And we're the hosts of Podcasting After Dark, a cast dedicated to late-night horror and sci-fi of the 80s and 90s, often found on HBO and Cinemax. You know, the movies your parents didn't want you watching as a kid. You can find us every other week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. This is what you want. This is what you get. Greetings, friends. My name is Dean Legero, and I'm the host of the 3324 Podcast. I invite you to join me and my lifelong friend Eric Kuber to come with us as we discuss the music and movies that shaped our life. Each week, we'll pick an album or film that we really connect to and not only give you some great info and trivia, but also discuss, debate, and celebrate what it means to us and the journey it took us on. We also look forward to hearing from you and giving us some of your picks for us to check out and discuss. I think it'll be a really fun experience, so come along with us for the ride. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider, and at 3324.buzzsprout.com. Thanks for your time, and welcome to the 3324 family. Boodling, it's time, let's check our cue, baby. Pair it with a couple brews, baby. We love good movies. We love the bad ones, too. So we watch them all and pass their lessons on to you. Oh, yeah. Everything I learned from movies helps to make life a little bit groovy. With a one last plot holes and gratuitous boobies. It's time to get busy with your friend Steve and Izzy. At eilfm.podbean.com. We now continue with our program. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked up.